privilege this morning of being with here with Jacob Johnson Johnston. He is the writer and director for the film. Uh, you know, it's it was it was a little a lot different than what I had expected, but <laughs> in a uh, a progressive horror way. I don't know how I don't know if that makes any sense to you. It is just using using things that you maybe you couldn't do in the '90s, but now because of the popularity of EDM, of, of, of parties like that and situations, uh, it's, it, it seems very viable and almost, you know, things that can happen. Can you tell us about the film? Absolutely. Um, and thanks for saying that. I, I think there is such a nostalgic uh, uh, hint of the 90s that I did want to bring back. Um, but obviously you can't, you know, retread the same path, especially in the horror genre. You know, I feel like that's the or, or thriller genre. Um, but, but the film, uh, on the surface, uh, it's, it's a very slasher setup. Um, group of friends witness something terrible, try to cover it up, and then get drawn into this uh, kind of hack and slash bloodbath. But um, it, it wasn't, to me, when I, was, when I was sitting down to write it, I didn't want to write a slasher film um, that just felt like it was a group of people who make terrible decisions and then just get axed. And, and so I, you know, obviously there's a lot of references to Faust and Shakespeare in the movie. Um, and that was something I really was, was excited about was, was imbuing this genre that's so notorious for surface level characters and trying to find these really strong, uh, relatable, thematic elements to, to kind of push in there. Um, so it wasn't just kind of like this run and gun um, uh, horror film. Um, so yeah, it's, and I feel like now in, in 2021, there's this subgenre that's been created, elevated horror. And <laughs> you know, it's, it's somehow become like, if your movie's not this, then you're just put into this category of like, oh, it's a slasher, oh, it's a haunted house movie. And mm -hmm. I, I think you do have to be progressive in, in a lot of ways to finding, you know, what people love about that type of film and then finding ways to pepper in um, social commentary uh, and, and authentic, um, relatable characters. So when they're watching it, there is something that they can latch onto that's not just, you know, how cool are the kill scenes. Absolutely. Uh, I definitely got hints of I know what you did last summer in there, a little bit of scream. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, your, your uh, well, not necessarily your slash uh, DJ Dreamcatcher. How did you develop that character? Um, <clears throat> the, the, the idea was, was really, I mean, there's so many of these DJs. It was kind of the perfect uh, vehicle for, for a killer, uh, a costume for a killer, because so much of the, the genre in the slash world is so much about the iconography. Who, who is the, who's the Jason? Who's the Freddy? What do they look like? Would you be able to recognize them in silhouette? Um, and so it was really about finding a way into finding the, the design of a character that made sense. Um, it was believable and it was grounded in some sort of like tactile element. And so when, when I was conceptualizing the story, it was like, why, why not make him a DJ? You know, why not make the, the central character and then whomever is going to don the mask, it makes sense because it's something real. Um, and I, I started working with a guy I used to work with at Marvel Studios named Josh Herman, uh, who's an incredible artist um, who designed characters like Groot for Guardians of the Galaxy and many of the Iron Man armors. Um, and we started talking about what I wanted the character to, to feel like and I, I really liked um, this, this idea of using barn owls and, mm. and this, uh, uh, the facade of an owl in terms of just the angles of the face, because it kind of emulates an exaggerated feature of the face. Um, and, and Josh did some really wonderful preliminary ideas and we kind of settled on this, this, uh, what we ended up with. Um, it was, it's, it's so simple, but at the same time, I feel like, and originally the lines were supposed to light up you know, you kind of get this in the mask. There's all these like kind of lines that create a dreamcatcher esque feel, and the uh, the original idea was that they would light up. Um, budget reasons, it didn't work, and for safety reasons, <laughs> there's some electrical issues with you know. People. So so we took that part out, um, but something we could revisit hopefully at some point. 
I, I found it super clever that you did use a DJ because I, I found myself thinking of, you know, some of the other popular DJs, Dead Mouse, Marshmallow, thing, people like that, who often wear masks, but yet this crowd allows themselves to be led, to be taken on this journey and experience. And, you know, when, when you take one of your, uh, when you took your, your character, I believe it was Josephine, and she's taken into this room and and she's taking it. I, I kind of got that. And I was like, you know, this is super clever. I, I really, really like the, the thought process behind this. And then the fact that you in the beginning also put everyone behind the mask, uh, I, I, it just, uh, it added a level of mystery that I enjoyed. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I <clears throat> I think to your, to your point as well, like, there was a conversation early on when we were shooting this up at the warehouse because a lot of times the DJs are not up that high. And I really wanted to sell exactly what you were saying, which is this idea that they're being led. This is a group of people who are willing to put their faith in someone who could be anybody. And <clears throat> he's up there in a, in a godlike stature uh, and they're raging hard. They're having the time of their life. And, and I felt like it was such an important thing to say thematically, like, here's a person who's 25 years old and is able to command this crowd from an angle where everybody has to look up to him. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so evocative of, of who Dylan is and the culture of, you know, self-obsession and, and self-made fame. So I, I, um, I had the chance already to speak with one of your producers, uh, uh, Crystal Veda, who was, who was great. We talked about the film for a very long time, actually. Sure. And, and uh, one of the things uh, we were talking about was Cataclysm, the underground music festival that is featured. And his design. Can you talk about how that, how you put that world together? Yeah, the uh, it was it was really a, a, a great collaboration between myself and Austin Johnson, who was the production designer. And the theme we really wanted to go for was this post-apocalyptic vibe. Hence the name Cataclysm. Um, <clears throat> but like setting the apocalypse and you know the future where people kind of wear these uh, not. Mad Max clothes, but these uh, more stylized uh, apocalyptic outfits, um, and you, you can't see you can't see a lot of it, the work that was put in because the light the lights are so dark. Um, but the the idea was to really lean into you know these these colors that contrast um, that put the audience in the festival. You know, I think the the thing about a movie like this is you want it to be aspirational, where when somebody He's watching it they're like man I wish I could be there with my friends or you know like I wish I was dancing to that music or uh adversely maybe they've been in somewhere like that you know so you can transform them or transport them to that place so it's like yeah I've been there I've got a drink at that bar I've seen that guy dancing you know in the corner um and finding small ways to just like seed uh like for instance in the in the bar scene there's a guy in the background that's juggling um, just finding ways where it's like, this is what happens with these things. People act weird and they do crazy things and they wear, you know, strange costumes. And, um, but, but uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of about finding a, a way to in, introduce a lot of color um, in a post-apocalyptic world that was also foreshadowing in, in the terms of the movie being kind of tragic. I want to talk a little bit about your script because you, you have a lot of layers in it. Uh, besides having the slasher, you also have characters that are dealing with retaining glory. Uh, sisterhood is another topic, trauma, and then just uh, just our overall identities of who we are. Uh, can you talk about the, the challenges or maybe just how fun you had with uh, putting that together and balancing it out to make sure that it worked in a slasher? Sure. It, it's the, <clears throat> it's a double-edged sword, I think, of, a, of this genre is, is they tend to be 90 minutes. You get an hour and a half to kind of set up the story, set up the characters and execute these really thrilling set pieces. And what I really appreciated with, with working with Brandon and Crystal was the ability to slow down and really understand who these people were. Um, the, the idea of using character development really is the backbone of the movie and not the kill scenes and not the kind of like long run, you know, the, the chase sequences, which are so fun to watch. I, I love watching them, but for me, it was like, how can I make you know, closer meet scream? How can I make saying almost fire meets? I know what you did last summer. How can I do these things that, you know, the, the character work and the chemistry. Um, and then so much of that, I also attribute to the cast, you know, the, the chemistry that they had together, the willingness that they um, had to kind of go to these places, both internally and externally. Um, it was really a joy to watch and, and finding ways that I could draw from, from my own experiences, uh, 
and, and things that I've gone through and, and slowly peppering that. And I think that usually ends up, um, not that I've you know been involved in a mass murder spree, but like <laughs> I do, I do believe that that finding uh, ways to represent trauma in different forms um, is is an extremely uh, smart way to connect to an audience because we've all felt something. You know, we've all experienced loss or fear uh, or or you know self doubt. Um, so I, I think that that was the, the the real exciting part in a script like this, where it was like you don't have to make it all about the hack and slash. You can really stop and take a moment where two characters can talk about something, and also mitigating the romance side of things. Not everybody is someone's boyfriend or someone's girlfriend. Right. A lot of the conversations do not hinge on talking about a relationship that is romantic, uh, unless it is unrequited. You know, so so really being able to to play with those. Um, ideas and, and tropes that we see so often in horror movies where it's like, oh, it's the two couples and the odd man out mm -hmm. and who's going to get it first, you know? So um, being able to play with, with expectations and hopefully in some places subvert them. Yeah. Having more realistic expectations. That's, that, that's definitely what I saw in one of the couples. Uh, I, can you comment on one of my favorite characters in the movie? Uh, uh, Nikki Ross's Pierce. Uh, I couldn't read her the whole film. I, I I was trying to decide more more than the ki who was the killer. Like what was where was her alliance? What was she up to? Did, is she you know what is she doing? I thought she was such a great character, and that and just the way she also dealt with Dylan, and and uh, I, I thought she was a very very important part of the film. Yeah, um, thanks for saying that. I, I her character is is um, really exciting to me because <clears throat> she really does have that Lady Macbeth uh, archetype where she's a little bit of the temptress. You know, she's got Jake on a string as her best friend, but also this person she knows will always be there. And, and I think she says it best when she's like, I, I don't know who I am. You know, her whole uh, character hinges on this, this, I don't even say an identity crisis, but rather the, the search for who she is and who she's going to become. And, and she sees that and finds that through Dylan um, and not in a romantic way, but rather, but rather in a way that's like an enabling. Um, and I think we all look for that in, in life where it's like, we sometimes associate ourselves or befriend people or you know, whatever with people who understand where we're coming from, not by, but by what we're saying, but rather by what's missing. Um, and I think that with her, She's, she's all of these pieces, all of these different puzzle pieces that are kind of scattered and she just needs to be put together. Um, and I know that, that in working with Nikki, she really did so much subtextually in her body language um, in the way that she's fun and, and funny sometimes and then she's internally broken in others, you know, other moments. Um, but that's the way it is. We, we, you know, people that are broken put on a pretty good face and, and, uh, and I think she did that extremely well and um, makes the character super compelling to watch, hopefully. Well, which is why she is my favorite. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you hope uh, audiences take away from Dreamcatcher? Because uh, I know it's been named one of the top 20 films to watch from USA Today and Newsday. So obviously there's, there's hype for this. Uh, yeah, it's... Um... <clears throat> It's it's two it's two things and, and you know one of them is is my own anxiety of being like I do believe the trailer makes it feel a lot more slasher than it is so I'm I'm excited for people who go in with an expectation to be I don't want to say let down but to be to be like oh it's going to be another slasher movie and and hopefully be taken on a journey that isn't what they expect it to be um, and I I hope that people take away that that there is the that there's different ways to approach the slasher genre and, and lots of people are you know doing it and finding new ways to, to innovate these ideas but I want people to have fun with it you know there is a lot of satire in it it shouldn't be taken too seriously but at the same time you know you use the mask of satire you use the mask of, of of slasher horror to guise these really great character stories so I hope the audience can find the beauty in in the character story in the uh you know, the development of these people and, and relate to them in some way. Um, that, that would be my, my biggest hope is that they can take away, like reading a really good book where, you know, when you finish it, you're like, you think about it, you talk about it and everybody's got a different point of view, um, but you still feel satisfied and, and maybe a little confused. 
Absolutely. And I think that's what I've really enjoyed about the film is now I've had the chance to talk to, to Crystal and to, to you about it. And as I'm preparing for the interviews and I'm having conversations with this, I learned so much more about it and I want to go watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go, I want to go check out a few things maybe that I missed and, and just to, to explore it a little bit further. So uh, I think you have the recipe there for a great film. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Jacob, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on your film Dreamcatcher. I believe it's out March 5th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we hope everybody goes out and watches it. Thank you. I hope you have a good one. You too. See ya. Right. Take care.